The eLife Podcast from eLife, the open access journal for outstanding research in the life and biomedical sciences. Online at elife.elifesciences.org. Hello, welcome to episode one of the eLife Podcast, produced by the Naked Scientists. I'm Chris Smith. Each month, we're going to be taking a look at some of the top papers published in the journal. In this edition, we'll find out how potato leaves stored in a museum for over a hundred years have revealed the cause of the Irish potato famine. Why people have more accidents driving in fog, and it's not because, as we originally thought, that they speed up. And how did cells evolve a way to wind up the DNA in their nuclei? But first, how did multicellular life evolve? Well, ancient ancestors of ours, the coanoflagellates, might give us a clue. My name is Rosie Alligato, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Nicole King's lab at UC Berkeley in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. We study coanoflagellates, which are the closest unicellular relatives to animals, and they look like little sperms with skirts. They have an ovoid or spherical body with a single flagellum surrounded by a little collar filled with actin. And what they do with their little collar is create water currents that cause bacteria to brush up against their collar so that then they can eat them. There are several different cell types that we can observe in culture when we grow these coanoflagellates. One of the most striking are these little balls of cells that we call rosette colonies. And the reason why they're very striking is because they look a lot like the morula stage, which is one of the very first stages of an animal embryo. And because quantoflagellates are the closest unicellular relatives to animals, we wondered what might regulate their formation and their development. So when you say the morula stage, this is them getting together to form a multicellular or at least an organism with more than one cell linked to it. Correct. And I think it's really important to distinguish how they form. And they're not formed by individual cells coming together. So it's not by aggregating together. They form from a single founder cell that after cell division remains together. That's also very important because that's the same mechanism by which animal development occurs. So do you think then that that what this organism is doing lies upstream of how when an egg begins to grow and the cells come from one founder cell to form the trillion or so cells that make a human, for example, is it a similar sort of mechanism here? So if we understand how it works, it sort of informs how multicellular organisms like us might be doing what they do. So we think that that's a very provocative possibility and certainly that may be the case. At this point in time, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because... There are about 125 different known species of quantoflagellates, but we don't know if they form colonies in the exact same way. And that's important because if they're all the same, then that would indicate that the ancestor of all the quantoflagellates also formed colonies in the same way. If they did, that would provide stronger evidence. This form of multicellular development might inform us about animal development, such as embryonic development. So what triggers them to go into this alternative state where they form cellular derivatives that all remain connected together? It was actually a complete surprise. It was really hard to control the cells in culture. They were very difficult to culture, and that was due to the bacteria that was co-isolated with them. And so there was an undergrad in the lab, and his project was to treat the coanoflagellate cell cultures with antibiotics with the hopes that by taming this culture, you know, making it more easy to propagate, it would be easier for genome sequencing. And the surprising thing that happened was when we treated them with antibiotics, all of the rosette colonies disappeared. And so you can imagine two possibilities. One is that the antibiotics directly affect the coanoflagellates in some way, but the other more tempting hypothesis was that we killed off a bacteria that was important for this developmental transition. And the second possibility turned out to be the case. Because, of course, you would know. I mean, you could test that hypothesis if you could get the, the organism to return to that rosette state 
having had it lost or taken away if you were to put those bacteria back in. That's right. And I have to say, the way that this unfolded was very lucky because most of the bacteria in the world are not easily culturable on plates by lab methods. And so even if it were a bacteria that caused it, it's not even sure that we would have been able to grow that bacteria. So we did two things. One was we took, you know, just whole cell uh, environmental bacteria and added it back. And that seemed to induce um, a return of the rosette colonies. And so we kind of had some idea, okay, there's something in here. Maybe it's something that's secreted by the bacteria. Maybe it's a metabolite. But it turns out that we were able to culture 64 different environmental isolates from this culture and then add them back individually. And only a single environmental isolate was was responsible for inducing this transition. Sorry to interrupt. It wasn't a contact phenomenon then. Could you do it with conditioning media? If you grew the bacteria in some media and collect just the media, no bacteria, and put that in, was that sufficient to make them form these rosettes? Indeed, it was sufficient for them to make the rosettes. And so that also um, gave us the idea that perhaps what this molecule was might be something that was intrinsic to the bacteria, something that they were making, not even in response to the quantiflagellates. That led us to think that, that maybe it was something that was very key to the bacteria's biology, such as something that was released unintentionally. And, and that's what turned out to be the case. It, it turned out to be a component of the cell envelope. So why do they form these rosettes in response to this secreted molecule from the bacteria? Uh, that is the million-dollar question. <laughs> we don't know why um, the rosettes form. We do have some evidence that quantiflagellates seem to be feeding better when they are organized in this multicellular state as opposed to being a single cell swimming around. And so that might be one possibility, that there's a feeding advantage. Certainly we don't know why a bacteria would put out a signal that says, eat me. So what we think might be happening is that, you know, the quantiflagellate might just be eavesdropping in on bacteria that are happily growing in. And this might actually be a signal to say, hey, this is, you know, a good patch of food. Stay around here, divide and make a rosette colony. Rosie Alligado. An international team of researchers from Germany and the UK have made headlines around the world by identifying the bug that caused the Irish potato famine, which killed more than a million people in the mid-19th century. First up, Sofian Kamoon, who heads the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich. We knew that the pathogen called Phytophthora infestans, a fungus-like organism, uh, was the agent of the potato blight that caused so much havoc in the 19th century and essentially triggered the Irish potato famine. What we didn't know is which strain caused the disease at the time. So what we did is we went back to herbarium specimens from museums, uh, extracted DNA from those specimens, And we were able, using the latest DNA technology, to sequence the genome of the pathogen and identify the strain that that caused the disease in the 19th century. I'm intrigued to think that people kept leaf specimens from affected plants from more than 150 years ago. Oh, no, there's a lot of interesting hidden treasures in all these museums. There's uh, millions of herbarium samples uh, in restored in museums uh, and that are studied usually to identify the species um, by looking, for instance, at flowers and the morphology of the leaves and so on. Uh, but in this case, we were able to do something uh, quite cool with it. We were able to actually look at the genetic makeup of the uh, organisms that were in those leaves. So you ground up some of the samples of leaves and extracted genetic material, which would have included both the genetic material of the potato and the genetic material of the blight that killed the plant. Yes, exactly. So we cut small pieces of, of the leaf and, and we were able to analyse both the plant and the pathogen. And in this case, in this study, we focused on the pathogen. That was the interesting bit. But people have, as you say, known that this was a fungus that was knocking around that did this. So what was the, the big question that needed to be answered here then that, that your research has enabled us to, to fill in a missing gap with? Well, first of all, you know, it's not a fungus. It's a fungus-like organism, so I'm correcting you. Sorry about that, but it's a different type of uh, microbe. Uh, But it does look like a fungus, so often people refer to it as a fungus. There are many strains of this pathogen. 
uh, what we discovered was that it's a new strain, uh, we called it Herb 1, that caused the uh, blight in the 19th century. And this strain apparently is gone. It's, it's, it's not around anymore. Why do you think that is? Is it that it was so good at devastating potato plants that as a result people just stopped growing susceptible species and it ran out of plants to infect? No, we don't think so. What probably happened is that as potato breeding started and took off in the 20th century and scientists started breeding better potatoes by crossing them to wild relatives of the potato, probably Herb 1 was at a disadvantage compared to other strains. And we know that in the 20th century, Herb 1 was replaced by another strain uh, we we know as US1. And, and then later on in the 20th century, US1 was replaced by additional strains. So is the sort of model then that you have plants that are susceptible to one of these organisms, the organism becomes more successful at working its way through those plants, and then the plants change or new types of plant come along which are more resistant, and so the pathogen changes, and we're just seeing a sort of arms race playing out. That's certainly part of the equation, but in fact what's amazing about this pathogen, Phytophthora infestans, the potato blight pathogen, is how adaptable it is. It's very good at adapting to new resistance vari- resistant varieties that breeders are releasing. How does it do that? What makes it so successful? Well, this is actually work we've been describing in the last few years, and we discovered that this pathogen has an amazing genome. In fact, we describe this genome as a two-speed genome. It's composed of two different types of compartments, if you like. One compartment contains the housekeeping genes, the, the key gene, the pathogen needs to be a microbe. And the second set of compartments contains all the virulence genes that are important for the pathogen to infect plants. And that second compartment is evolving and changing much more rapidly than the the slow evolving housekeeping compartment, if you like. Do you know why those bits of the genome change so fast, whereas bits elsewhere in the genome don't? How does the organism do that? I wish I knew why. That's a very interesting topic we're studying. Sophie and Camoon. A co-author on the paper was Max Planck Tübingen scientist Hernan Babano, who's famed for his part in sequencing the Neanderthal genome. He commented on what this paper adds. I think the first thing is, uh, this is like kind of a proof of principle experiment, saying first, OK, it is possible to do that. So the amount of DNA is enough, the quality is good, and one can reconstruct genomes. Then one can compare these pathogens with pathogens present nowadays, then we could establish the relationship between them. So it was hypothesized that the Irish famine was caused by a strain that was named US1, that was the most common variant like outside Mexico in the 20th century. And why, why I mentioned Mexico? Because Mexico is supposed to be the center of origin of this pathogen. What we have found is that it is not the same even though it is closely related, it's a different strain of Phytophthora that causes disease. In addition, we have collected samples from many geographical locations, continental Europe, Ireland, England, and also from North America. And we have found that it was the same strain that was causing the disease, so it was a, a pandemic. And what impact did that have on the potatoes that were being grown once this thing kicked in? So at the time of the 19th century, there were like some uh, cultivars of potato that were around, and they were totally susceptible to Phytophthora infestants. So once these Phytophthora infestants migrated to Europe, it was very easy to kill because the plants were naive and could not resist. What happened at the beginning of the 20th century, people start to do breeding. So and this breeding consists in taking wild potatoes from Central and South America who were naturally resistant to the pathogen and introducing, by breeding these genes, to the new cultivar that we have nowadays. So you can imagine that that was a big pressure also for the pathogen. So we could witness, actually, with the genomes that we sequenced, this coevolution between the host and the pathogen, because we see, for example, that there are some genes on the pathogen that it doesn't matter if it has it or not if the potato is not resistant. So these variants were, were, were there. But when we look at the 20th century samples, we can see like this shift on the type of variants that were present. And this shift might have been caused by a selection pressure that is having resistant genes that were introduced into potato.
Hernan Babano. You're listening to the eLife podcast with me, Chris Smith. Still to come, how hepatitis B recognises a liver cell. Chinese scientists have discovered the surface receptor for the virus. And German scientists reveal how our driving behaviour alters subtly in foggy conditions. But first, here's a word from scientist and eLife deputy editor, Fiona Watt. eLife is all about a publishing revolution. It is a journal which is fully funded by three organisations, the Wellcome Trust, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Max Planck Society. And by fully funded, I mean that at present, none of the authors pay and none of the readers pay for the content. eLife was launched with three main objectives. The first was a feeling that it was important to push the concept of open access further, that the open access movement in a sense had started well but had stalled. Second was that if we published a journal which was purely digital with no paper copy, we could completely revolutionize the way content is explored by the authors and by the referees. And then thirdly, very importantly, we felt there was a need to take science publishing back into the hands of scientists. As I like to say, we wanted to end the tyranny of that bastard referee three. So in other words, we wanted to avoid months and months of papers being revised and resubmitted, young scientists' careers really on the line because of a single referee wanting more and more data. Well, let's look at each of these things in turn but since you've brought up the the review process first I was sitting in a meeting at my institution the other day and one of the professors of one of the research uh, departments at Cambridge University said it's not uncommon when you send your papers off somewhere that a referee will come back with some suggested additional experiments that basically they are a year's work. I don't know really at what stage this really began to spin out of control but certainly my experience in my lab is that When we submit the paper, we are probably looking at at least six months' work, even if we have favourable reviews. So how will eLife address that? The process of handling papers in eLife is distinctive in a number of ways. All of the people involved in the review process are practising scientists, so we're all accountable. Secondly, when a paper is submitted, we line up members of our, if you like, college of referees who are actually paid to be part of the review process and we have an online discussion about the paper. So we ask uh, authors to submit a simple PDF and we aim to make a quick decision about whether or not the paper is likely to fly at eLife. And if a decision is made that the paper should go out for review, we've already lined up people who are familiar with the content of the paper and are committed to steering it through the full review process. But how does this solve the problem of that nasty referee number three who then says, I want 18 months more experiments to be done before I will consider this adequate for publication? Well, if your paper has gone out for full review, it will typically be three reviewers. And when the reviews come in, we consider, do we in principle want to publish this paper? And if so, can the authors fix the bits that need to be fixed in a short time frame? We would say uh, ideally three months. Then instead of regurgitating the reviews verbatim, we draft a high-end summary where we highlight the things that we think are important and doable. The second point you made was about not being tied to print. So how does that benefit eLife and the people who want to send their papers to you? Not being tied to print has been a very interesting experience. We could say, well, do we really need a two-column width format if most people are going to be reading the paper on an iPad? How would we want to look at the figures? We're experimenting now with uh, something called lens, which means that as you pass the cursor over the text, figures will appear exactly where you want them. Movies, for example, are fully embedded in the paper, so you can play the movies as you're reading the text. And it's a process which is still evolving, but we want people to be able to essentially play with the data 
interact with it in ways that have not been possible up till now. And I suppose the benefit of, of beginning with something which is built for that purpose rather than taking a traditional print process and trying to turn it into something that has that functionality, it must be easier, more streamlined. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, one rather amusing effect of, of being purely digital is that when we've had stands at uh, scientific conferences to publish eLife, people are so used to picking up hard copies of the journal that we felt um, we didn't really have enough beyond a few T-shirts and an iPad. So, so we really had to think about um, better ways to display what we're up to. Well, I think if you gave away iPads, that would probably attract quite a well, curious crowd. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if you'd like to suggest giving away iPads, that would be fine. But uh, you know, we're going to have them anchored to the stand. Um, but it, it will be a great chance for people to see what we mean about handling the data in different ways. And also you mentioned that you felt that open access, which is obviously a major driver for eLife, you felt that process had stalled. Why did you think that? I was really referring to data uh, from the Wellcome Trust, so they have been pioneers in the UK of the open access movement, and they monitor compliance. People who are funded by the Wellcome Trust must publish their work, make it openly available to others. And compliance was rising steadily until a couple of years ago when it seemed to sort of level out at about 55%. So they actually now have introduced a stick as well as a carrot to make sure that their grant holders make their work freely available. So I think eLife gives scientists a platform to publish their very best work, open access and completely at no cost to them. So I do think that is going to be a boost for open access. Fiona Watt. The liver virus, hepatitis B, is thought to have infected up to a third of the world's population, two billion people, half a billion of them chronically. Hep B also has a partner in crime called hepatitis D, which is a subviral particle that borrows the coat proteins of hepatitis B and quite literally rides on its coattails. And although there's an excellent vaccine that can prevent infection with both of these agents, scientists still didn't know how the virus was recognising and entering liver cells. And this is important because if we know how it gets in, we can potentially design drugs to block the process, helping people who are already infected. Now, Wang Wei Li from the National Institutes of Biological Sciences in Beijing has made just that discovery. We want to find the functional receptor for hepatitis B and hepatitis D virus, which uh, infected uh, one third of the world population, and how it enters a hepatocyte, which is the target cells of that, has been unknown for several decades. We just want to identify the receptor for this virus. So although we know that hepatitis B and its relative hepatitis D get into liver cells, until now, no one knew exactly how they were doing that. Yes. So we've identified a very specific bio transporter which could function as a functional receptor for this virus. So this is just a chemical which is present on the cell's in the liver, which the virus is docking onto and using to get in? Yes, it's a protein. Many expressed in liver, the protein lab is a sodium toracolate co-transporting polypeptide, in short, NTCP, and it's a multiple transmembrane protein and predominantly expressed in liver at the sinusoidal membrane, that is the blood side of the hepatocyte, and it functions as a bioacid transporter and is critical for the enterohepatic circulation of bioacid. Can you explain to me how the technique worked? How did you home in on that protein in the membrane in order to prove that this was the receptor that hepatitis B and hepatitis D were using? Yeah, so we combined biochemistry and biological approaches. Uh, we developed a unique and a very highly efficient approach for tandem purification of complex membrane proteins. 
we utilized a viral protein ligand in which we incorporate three tags of photoreactive non-natural amino acids in the receptor binding site, an epitope adjacent to the receptor binding site for antibody recognition, and a biotin tail. So the photoleucin allowed zero distance cross-linking of the peptide ligand and its binding re receptor upon UV irradiation. So what you've done is to insert some fake, for want of a better word, amino acids into the virus protein, which when you shine ultraviolet light on them will form bonds to anything nearby them. And you've also got a tag on there so that you can grab it with an antibody or with biotin. And you incubate this modified virus protein with cell surface membranes and then zap them with the light to make the protein stick on irreversibly to anything it's bonded to at the moment, at that moment in time, and then you purify it. Is that right? Right, yeah. That's exactly what we did. And we then used the LCMS, that is mass spectrometry, to analyze the target protein. So by basically asking what is this molecule, you can you come up with a, a chemical formula for the protein. But how do you work out what that is in the cell? Because there must be lots of proteins in the cells that are going to have a similar chemical formula. Yes, we took several approaches to prove that is the, the molecule we want. Uh, first of all, we use a small interferon RNAs to knock down this molecule into the, in the cells. And uh, we check... The, whether the infection of HPV and HTV is uh, affected by this uh, gene silencing. And then we express this NTCP molecules into the HU7 cells, which normally does not express this protein. And we evaluate whether the uh, viral infection could be enhanced by transfecting this molecule. That's quite neat. So effectively you turn a cell which is uninfectable into a cell that becomes infectable as soon as you express this molecule in it, thus proving that this is necessary and sufficient for hepatitis B and hepatitis D viruses to get into these cells. Correct. So now that you know this target, is it the only target on cells? In other words, if you take cells in a dish and, as you have done, put this receptor molecule into them, do you get the same sort of turnover or growth in the cells or the efficiency of infection of the cells that you would in a human who was challenged with hepatitis B? Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, we think that this molecule is the predominant one, if not the only one of the receptor. Uh, however, if you transfect this receptor into cells, it can supports the viral infection, but not as efficient as in vivo. There's many reasons for this, uh, and the uh, detailed mechanism is still unknown. Now that you know what the receptor is, though, what do you think the implications of your discovery are? Uh, this discovery advances our understanding of HPV and HDV infection, and I think it also may raise the possibility to develop new therapeutics approaches for these viral infections. There are some drugs available against this NTCP, but we don't know yet if they can block the viral infection. Wang Wei Li. Fog now, and what happens when a person drives in it? Paolo Preto from the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen, Germany, has clarified a few issues related to drivers' perceptions of their speed in foggy conditions, as he explains to Martha Henriquez. So there were a lot of accidents in fog, right? We blame low visibility conditions. And uh, there were a couple of papers in the past that just said, we can explain why this happens, and they provided a, an explanation which was quite comfortable. When you're driving fog, because fog is uh, simply a natural way uh, to reduce visual contrast, and we know that a low visual contrast leads to lower perceived speed, then what happens to the drivers is they perceive their own speed being lower 
and therefore you accelerate to match what the actual speed will look like in a, a clear visibility condition. So what the, these papers did was that they brought this to a situation of self-motion. So when the, there is no object moving, but the observer itself is moving in the environment. So they, they, they considered this for the first time. And the problem is that the, the way they reduced their contrast was the same way that was used in the laboratory conditions. So they reduced the contrast of the visual seeing of the driver in a, in a driving simulation uh, uniformly, independently of depth, independently of the distance from the observer. And so that was, the, let's say, the, what was missing in the previous study, and that's what we did in, in our new, new study. And in those previous studies, their simulations were more like driving with a misted up or dirty windscreen, whereas you adjusted contrast so that it seemed more like actually looking at fog outside through a clear windscreen. Why is that an important difference, and how does that affect human perception of speed when driving? The difference is uh, <laughs> it's quite subtle. So um, no one had ever tried before us to uh, simulate a gradient of contrast reduction. So uh, a contrast which is not reduced uh, uniformly all over the visual field, but different regions have different contrast reductions. And that's, uh, that's basically the new part. So you created a more realistic simulation of driving in foggy conditions, and the initial models used were essentially just too simple, and you've added yeah, in a few more factors yeah, to make it... they were not appropriate, yeah, yeah okay. for simulating realistic fog. And once you have this better idea of the way fog should be modelled, what happened when you got some drivers into these simulators for testing? Well, we used different methods. I mean, we did some study on the perceptual side, so studies which are basically uh, passive for, the, for our subjects, so they don't have to do a driving task, but with this kind of methodologies, we can somehow quantify their perception. We can relate their internal representation of their speed to the actual current physical speed that they are driving at. So we measure what is technically called the point of subjective equality, so when two different speeds are matched to different scenes, moving scenes, and with that we derive the perceived velocity, the perceived speed of, of the driver. And another method that we used was more like a behavioral neuroscience method, so we asked our participants, our subjects, to drive, to do some uh, driving task, and by trying to match a given target speed they were trained to, to reproduce uh, before the real experiment. And with that one, we could measure the other side. So we could measure the production of speed. And by that, we could uh, relate the effect of perceived speed that we measured in the psychophysical experiments with the uh, observable changes in the behavior of the drivers that we measure in the second experiments. So you found that the perceived speed was significantly higher than the speed produced by the drivers in the simulator, meaning they would actually tend to drive more slowly in foggier conditions. So in fact, our instincts seem to be telling us to do the sensible thing and slow down. So in fact, speed perception doesn't seem to be a factor that would make us more prone to traffic accidents in fog after all. What we did in our study was to concentrate on the, uh, on the perceptual effect, so on the... On the visual motion that was processed by the drivers. But we know that when we drive, there is not only perception going on. We, we have also, uh, I mean, our, our own motivations, right? That's, for example, if we are in a hurry, if we have an appointment, we will speed up, we will drive faster. So we simply will ignore what our perception, what our brain will suggest us. There are a lot of uh, higher older cognitive factors that overcome the, the, the perceptual effects. If we uh, try to you know, simplify and we try to analyze separately the perception, that's what we found. So the brain would kind of uh, suggest us to drive safely. Uh, we don't do it, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and so how do you think these findings might influence, say, road safety campaigns or policy? What do you think might be the practical applications that your work could contribute to? At the time we, we conceived the study, we were not really concerned about practical applications, but after seeing the results, uh, we actually uh, realized that this could be uh, kind of useful for, for many different fields. 
For example, we know that in the driving simulation community, there is always a problem, and the, the problem is that in the simulation, all the drivers overestimate their own speed. With, uh, with, with our findings, we could think of some application in the future where playing around with the contrast of the visual scene, we could somehow adjust more or less efficiently towards higher or lower levels of perceived speed in the simulation. Paolo Preto speaking with Martha Henriquez. And finally this month, how did our cells come by their nucleosomes? These are short stretches of DNA wrapped around a sort of protein ball. The nucleosomes help us to pack DNA tightly inside our cell nuclei and they also control when genes get turned on and off. But now, speaking with Kat Arney, Corey Nislo at the University of British Columbia has discovered that these structures were probably doing something else before they were turned by our sorts of cells into spools for DNA. We noticed that nucleosomes occupied a very characteristic position in the genome. As any good biologist would do, we set about trying to perturb that, and we spent a lot of time looking at mutants in yeast, and some of these mutants in yeast were extremely informative, but most weren't. And so we wanted to look at an extreme environment to, to see, you know, like push the system to failure to the point where um, we knew we were going to see some kind of, like if we didn't see a dramatic um, change in the location of nucleosomes, we would really start to uh, wonder what's going on. So we start to look for extremophilic organisms, organisms that live in, you know, near boiling water or uh, near saturated solutions of salt. As we were looking for eukaryotes in those environments, we kept finding archaea or archaeobacterial organisms. They were all over the place in boiling water environments, in environments where the salt concentration is so high that the salt will actually be precipitating out of solution, like in the Dead Sea. Rather than keep looking for eukaryotes in those environments, we, we started to say, well, maybe, maybe we should look at these archaea. And archaea have nucleosomes that are remarkably similar to eukaryotic nucleosomes, except their half size. Using new mapping technology, specifically next generation sequencing, we prepared nucleosomes from archaea, and we also prepared RNA at the same time. So we can ask, one, is the organization the same in archaea as it is in eukaryotes? And two, is this correlation that we see between gene expression and nucleosome positioning maintained? And I wouldn't be talking to you if the answer to both questions wasn't yes. So what did you find? So we found that this, this parallel universe is exactly what's going on in that uh, the entirety of the archaeobacterial genome is wrapped up in nucleosomes. It's the, the frequency of the wraps are twice that of what you see in eukaryotes because they're half the size and they only wrap half as much DNA. And the regions that have fewer nucleosomes are regions at the beginnings and ends of genes where other proteins need to fight for access to the DNA to turn things on and off. And that's exactly what you find in, in eukaryotes as well. And that's why I, I was saying it's re- it was really like a little uh, parallel universe for us. When you found this, what did you think? Because traditionally there's been views that archaea and eukaryotes are, are very separate in terms of their, their evolution and they're, they're separate branches of an evolutionary tree. What do you think now in the light of your experiments? Originally histones were thought of as a wonderful device for packing DNA into a tiny space. Each of us has over four meters of DNA that we have to squeeze down into a nucleus that's only five millionths of a meter in diameter. And so one of the things they must be doing is serving as the ultimate packing material. But archaea don't have nuclei and therefore don't have the same constraints of really shoving all of their DNA into such a tight space. And so 
we let ourselves wonder if, given the fact that the nucleosomes in archae are intimately linked with the gene expression patterns, that maybe evolution first used nucleosome to control gene expression, and then shortly thereafter, when it came time to get everything into the nucleus, it co-opted that mechanism. You know, this wouldn't be the first case where proteins moonlight and serve multiple functions. Corey Nislow, he was speaking with Kat Arney. That's it for this month. If you would like to follow up on any of the papers that we've been discussing, they're, of course, freely available on the eLife website. My name's Chris Smith from The Naked Scientists, and do please join me next month for another look at what's happening in eLife. Until then, goodbye. The eLife Podcast from eLife. The open access journal for outstanding research in the life and biomedical sciences. Online at elife.elifesciences.org.